Good evening, friends, and welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are retired New York City police detectives, and if you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, please hit the subscribe button, hit that notification bell, so you'll get all things Duty Ron and this guy over here, Ed Wallace, when we go live or upload another video. Hey, tonight, as promised, we're going to go over the Michelle Traconis trial, the DNA evidence Week one is in the books, and what a week it was. We had two jurors dismissed for blabbering, jabber jarring. We had a bunch of cross examinations and a bunch of arguments with the defense and the prosecution and the judge. Um, a lot to talk about here, Ed, when it comes to forensics, and this is right up your alley forensics. What did you call it? Forensic Sunday? Sa Sunday, Science Sunday. Science Sunday instead of Forensic Friday. Ed, what's your thoughts on uh, what we've seen here? You know, you and I were at Army training uh, in over upstate New York. So this trial was unfolding. A lot of, you know, a lot of work going on on your end. And we, we were going to do a live stream from the hotel, but it didn't work out that way. But what was your thoughts of, you know, Tuesday through Friday on the Traconis trial, Michelle Traconis? Well, there was a lot of, as you said, shenanigans going on with the jurors. I, I don't know what the hell's going through their mind, unless that one guy that you know said "I love you" to the assistant district attorney just wanted to get himself off the jury. The other guy referenced the God Girl and saying, you know, so uh, you know he tried to you know taint the jury with uh, that Gone Girl comment that he was believing that uh, she's not really dead and it's a Gone Girl scenario. Mm -hmm. And that's like again nuts. He, he stop all the trial call in all the juries, uh, jury members and, and voir dire them and question them and then kick the two knuckleheads off. And uh, thank God there was no mistrial. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. And I'm sure that most of the folks who are here watching were, were thinking the same thing. It's like, what kind of twilight zone is this? What am I watching? You know, Michelle Traconis is standing trial and is, you know, she's, trying to battle a uh, conspiracy to commit murder charges, which are very serious. Uh, and the prosecution, it's up to the state. It's up to the state to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's up to the um, defense attorney to, to create doubt. And I think, you know, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing a lot of that. But forensics and the experts that uh, that partake in forensics they know their stuff and we heard from lieutenant colonel we heard from detective riley um a female from the lab and also the uh, the nanny um not about forensics obviously but that was the testimony that we heard in week one in this trial and they're saying it's going six to eight uh six to eight weeks that's that's a long time and i don't see it ending in six to eight weeks because no, of all the shenanigans. No, but not only just, yeah, the shenanigans, the defense is uh, arguing about everything under the sun. Uh, he's throwing um, feces against the wall and trying to see what sticks. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, so, but honestly, but right now from what I've seen of the trial, you know, nothing um, so far sticks to her. They haven't gotten into um, all of the, areas where she was involved they just started at the end uh where they were trying to um bring the um computer forensics guy in who captured um or gathered all the surveillance footage in hartford that tracks them um going from garbage can to garbage can yeah and and that's an an important part of this case because it shows that michelle tracona spent a great deal of the day in question May 24th of 2019 and possibly the 25th and whatever else we don't know about uh, how much time she spent with Otis, they were living together, right? So this situation and what she did on the days and the hours that followed this alleged crime that happened, um, this is how the state can prove their case. Hey, I wanted to play a, a quick report from um the end of day, uh, I believe this was the end of day Friday, uh, and it might have actually have been Thursday, so correct me if I'm wrong, folks in the chat. I know you guys are good at that, uh, but I want to say thank you to our Patreon supporters, the channel members, the replay viewers, the moderators. Ed, we have the best mods in the business. These guys and girls, they give us their time, and they make sure the chat stays classy, and, and that's what's 
that's what makes this a really great community and a, and a learning community. Thanks to you and, and, and some of the great guests that we bring on here, Ed. Absolutely. I mean, even in the, um, in the YouTube ch uh, chat area, YouTube comment area, I see really respectful um, disagreements, you know, agree to disagree type of situations. Nobody is saying you're an idiot or this or that. We don't, we don't stand for that here. Okay. We, we're respectful. We can agree to disagree respectfully. Because each of us have our own opinions on things, no matter what the science says, you know, we can always uh, voice our thoughts and our opinions as long as it's done in a respectful way. Let's go to this, Ed, and we'll play this. This gives you a little bit of an overview, and we'll be back to you in a few minutes. Chat amongst yourselves. Well, good evening to you both. Yeah, today jurors sat through hours of scientific specifics as a forensics investigator combed through DNA she did and didn't find from evidence found at Jennifer's home. In my mind, it clearly does show that something happened to uh, Jennifer Dulos in that garage. Day five of the Michelle Traconis trial. Prosecutors presenting this witness who tested DNA evidence. Investigators say they found on scene at Jennifer Dulos's New Canaan home with a big focus in her garage, a place police believe Jennifer was attacked, leaving blood-like stains with her DNA behind. DNA testing is a forensic tool of comparison. So we want to try to include or exclude a possible uh, person as being a contributor to that evidentiary profile. Kristen Medell with the State Forensic Lab went over dozens of examples of those stains showing a likely match to Jennifer's DNA. They used swabs from her toothbrush to compare. Is at least 100 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from the source of the DNA profile from a swabbing of the electric toothbrush. Medell also compared evidence to swabs from the five Dulos children, Jennifer's estranged husband, Fotis, their family nanny, and one of Fotis's employees, Pavel Gemini. For Fotis, most samples were either inconsistent or inconclusive, but his DNA was a likely match on at least two occasions, on a door handle near the mudroom and from blood-like stains found on the kitchen sink. The DNA profile from item 5S1 is at least 4.3 billion times more likely to occur if it originated from Fotis Dulos. Outside of a few other likely matches with the Dulos children and their nanny, yep. the others were excluded from matching DNA found on scene, including the defendant, Michelle Traconis, who police believe plotted with Fotis to cover up Jennifer's murder. There is no place in New Canaan or in that suburban that has Michelle Traconis' DNA. Now, prosecutors do believe Fotis attempted to clean up the crime scene at Jennifer's New Canaan home. Now, coming up at six o'clock, we'll hear from the forensics specialist about how that alleged cleanup could have impacted the DNA. So I wanted to go to you, Ed, with these numbers that we're hearing some of these forensic experts throw out there. They're very damning numbers. Um, but people in the chat are confused because some folks are saying that they feel like the state um, has got a, a little bit of a weak case when it comes to forensics because of certain things happening. But I know you'll you'll let everybody know what's going on with that. But I just wanted to get your thoughts on what this report had to say here. Well, I mean, uh, as we know, you know, he, he was not supposed to be in that house. OK, um, can is there a way um, if he was never in there for his DNA to get there? Yes, there can be some cross contamination issues with his children. But then you would have had a mixture of DNA on the faucet, on the doorknob and um, and so forth. And it would have, that wasn't the case. OK, um, in, in addition uh, she didn't, the victim didn't either beat or stab herself to death in the garage. Okay. Somebody did it. Okay. There's the blood spatter shows that an attack occurred on the driver's side of the, um, Land Rover and that the suburban was parked, um, facing outward in the spot to the left of the, um, Land Rover and got obtained blood spatter as well that's 
significant because it's typically associated with blunt force trauma or stabbing, okay? Uh, and it occurred um, pretty low to the ground in between the two vehicles. Yeah, and, and that, when you look at that, it really, it, when you're looking at that vehicle, um, the Range Rover in particular, and then we saw some photographs of underneath the uh, the other SUV that was allegedly back parked in, actually, we could say definitively that car had to have been backed into that second stall in that two-car garage. Well, looks like a three-car garage, but um, yeah, when you look at those things, you have to say something really bad happened here. And I think in our conversations privately, we talked about the potentiality of um, of her being run over inside that garage. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that because the uh, a good look at the suburban on the carriage uh, and where the spatter position is, it, it, it's pretty it's pretty evident that it came. The spatter was projected from in between the two vehicles as opposed to having somebody run over underneath it. Um, but again, I believe he. Uh, yeah, the defense attorney. Yeah, Christina, I saw that. Yeah, the defense attorney kept saying splatter, kept saying splatter. And I wanted to really, um, you know. <laughs> gets uh you know get some blunt force trauma to the defense attorney to show him what spatter really is uh but anyhow uh he got corrected so many times but he kept saying it over and over again it was like a mental block with him he can't say the word spatter it's splatter he keeps saying splatter 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 <laughs> not spatter but anyhow um so uh he lied in wait photos lied in wait uh for his estranged wife to come home and he jumped her in that garage yeah. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Okay. And we're going to show you, um, the bloodstain pattern analysis conducted by uh, the Lieutenant Colonel from who was now a Lieutenant Colonel at the time he did, he was a Lieutenant who did the bloodstain pattern analysis. Uh, we're going to show you his findings, his uh, two dimensional area of convergence and a three dimensional area of, uh, origin, um, for uh, at least two of the stains, <laughs> at least two of the stains that he worked up in addition. There's contact transfer evidence there, and there's wipes and swipes, and there's attempts to clean up, and there's evidence of paper towel usage uh, with remnants of paper towels uh, being left behind um, after attempting to clean up uh, off a concrete surface. Yeah. And so many people in the chat are saying, you know, the splatter drove me nuts by the defense, Mel Mack says. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, you know, uh, a lot of our viewers Ed, are well educated because they're watching you and listening to you closely. Um, but you know, maybe in years past, people would, that would have flew by and nobody would have caught it. Um, but yeah, so it's it's interesting to see in this day and age in 2024, you have a defense attorney who's not up to speed, and his defense is defending uh, this DNA evidence and and the and 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 the blood, and and it's just. You know, spatter, not splatter, guys. Uh, no, I think also, didn't the nanny testify like there's like a whole package of paper rolls that are missing? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. she did testify to that. Mm -hmm. Ten rolls of paper. Here it is. Uh, Southern Charm, thank you for that. Uh, ten rolls of paper towels were used overnight in that location. And who yeah, knows what else? We're going to talk about um, altered blood stains. We're going to talk about contact transfers. We're going to talk about footwear impressions and so forth. So let's right. get into it. I'm going to let this roll here. Um, and, and, and if you want me to fast forward, you just let me know. So this is testimony from day six in the afternoon. Sir, are there any transfer stains or perhaps you could just describe it? Um, so th this photograph is of the, uh, say, if we're facing the garbage cans, it's the right garbage can. So the one closest to the garage door. Um, uh, Can you well, stop it and transfer and and zoom in a little? By the square. Um, I. Mm. Can you like touch your screen and try to expand it? Hold on. I I, I may be able to stop it and zoom. Just give me two seconds. Rectangular. Okay, so what the lieutenant colonel is uh, pointing out is what's called a contact transfer of um, blood to the garbage can corner here um, by s someone or some person or some item that had blood on it and then came in contact with the garbage can that didn't have blood and then the blood transferred to it. Remember Lacard's exchange principle, right? Yeah, we all do. We all remember that. So um, 
Go ahead. So we can't uh, or can't zoom no. in. No. All right, because there appears to be some type of pattern there too, as I see linear lines. So let him, let let's hear his testimony. Uh, contains some defined edges, some voids within those within those edges, um, in somewhat elliptical shapes, which is uh, as characteristic of a pattern transfer. Okay, so pattern. Now, there's two potential types of patterns that you that were found here. One of the, um, well, actually there are three, but one is a footwear impression. Okay. We'll get into that a little later. One is a possible dishwashing glove impression. And one is a possible paper towel impression. So um, I'm going to show you quickly a uh, paper towel. And then I'm going to zoom in on the paper towel so that you can see the pattern that's here. So when this gets wet with blood, and if this now touches a surface that doesn't have blood, it could transfer this pattern's image to that object. So that's one side of the towel. Now the opposite side of the towel has a different pattern. So it all depends on what side of the towel was soaked in blood and touched the surface, okay? Um, so that's one possible transfer. The other possible transfer, as we learned from, um, uh, detective, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, I'm brain Riley, Riley, detective Riley, that they recovered a pair of gloves just like this from the kitchen. And, and you can see the pattern that is on here. Okay. And so I did a series of experiments, uh, today with various things like the gloves and the paper towels. And I wet them with blood, and I transferred them uh, to plastic from a front um, car grill and chrome from a front car grill, similar to the um, garbage can and similar to the Range Rover, the Land Rover, okay? And I showed also um, how these patterns would appear on those surfaces and I think what we're going to see later on when we get into those photographs is how similar these patterns are to either gloves or paper towel. And if you had good quality photographs of those items, you can, and then you had collected the paper towels, which they did collect a roll of paper towels from the kitchen. Uh, you can conduct a series of tests between the gloves that they collected from the kitchen and the paper towel because uh, you had possession of the Land Rover, you after you documented and collected those blood stains, those contact transfers on the garbage cans and the blood the blood stains on the Range Rover, you can then wipe them clean and then attempt to replicate them with the glove or the paper towel to see which one of them most um, appropriately matches the pattern that you're seeing here. And so, you, but again, it's very difficult to repl replicate the amount of blood on, on these items and the pressure uh, that was used, but it still can be done. And, and then you can, then you can say, okay, it appears that this pattern that we're seeing in blood was the towel. Oh, and yet this pattern on the Range Rover, the Land Rover was the glove. Okay. What likely source was this? Well, the likely source was that. And get yeah, it. This is what makes you a badass, Ed, because um, this is what goes on behind the scenes, and and this is what is involved in forensic investigations. So Linda asks, where do I get the blood? Well, there are forensic suppliers that supply blood for training. So I have I do blood stain pattern training for the New Jersey State Police twice a year, and um, I did it for uh, six years for the New York City uh, Office of Chief Medical Examiner's Office and the forensic science training program that I ran there. Uh, and so I buy the blood uh, for my training courses. I was wondering, Ed, why when I was in the hotel, you said, hey, can I draw some blood from you? I was curious about that. And, and I gladly um, donated a whole bag of blood to Ed. That wouldn't be the first time we've had a phlebotomist come in and draw blood from our students uh, to use in aspirated blood uh, testing. Folks, I was just kidding about that. So just so you know, that was, did not happen. Uh, let's let the rest of this play because he gets into some other areas of that garage besides the garbage can here. And with respect to picture 25, sir. 
Uh, picture 25 is the left garbage can, so the one further away from the garage door. Uh, in the center portion of this photograph, uh, just above the um, upper white rectangle is, uh, is a transfer stain. But um, let me just make sure it's on. Okay. <coughs> if you look behind you, you use this tripod device to okay. up just, with a. Just shut him down. Just leave that up. Okay. I don't need to hear him anymore. He's going to say splatter a couple times and get me going over the edge. But anyhow, if you see that tripod right there, you see a series of pink strings that are coming up from the floor from various stains. And what, what, they're, what they've done here is they measured the length and width of each of the stains that are on the floor. And they did a trigger, trigonometric function on the uh, stains. They, you divide um, the width by length, the smaller number by the larger number. You get a decimal. You times that by arc sine. Remember all that trigonometry you learned back in high school and you said, when am I ever going to use this shit? Well, yes. Here okay, here you go. This is how we use this, okay? And, and then once you get that number you're given it's given you a degree of angle of impact onto the floor now what you could see on the car door behind you is some stringing going on there and you can see where at least three of the strings converge together in the center there and that is known as the two-dimensional area of convergence mm -hmm. so in this case on the floor you would string along the floor or you would draw with a marker along the floor by by drawing a line um, through the center of the stain, but you don't actually draw through the stain, but you kind of bisect it um, and then draw the line. And wherever those lines converge, that is your two-dimensional area of origin. So the two-dimensional area of origin is the center pole of the tripod, okay? And then once you do the angle of impact calculations, the strings come up from the floor and then intersect with the center pole. And that's, where the blood was let from the victim at that height in the middle there uh, where's where the victim's uh, blood came from. Now, in order to create spatter or what's called radial impact spatter, first you have to create, create a wound that is bleeding. The first impact, whether it's a blunt force trauma, I hit you over the head, that doesn't create spatter. It creates a bleeding wound. And then any subsequent impacts into the blood then creates the spatter, mm -hmm. okay? So in his determination, uh, he found two distinct um, radial impact spatter uh, patterns, one on the car door and one coming up to the floor to that tripod. Now, you can see the two-dimensional area of origin on the car door, okay? It's much lower than the one that's on the tripod. So, um, so you can see the various heights things were occurring at in between uh, the driver's side of the Land Rover and on this other side was the Suburban, which has impact spatter on it as well. Okay. Look at this comment here. Sasha Johnson says, head wounds bleed and spurt equal spatter. Um, you know, it's a possibility, but it's not always how it goes. But Mm -hmm. Depends on the violence and, and the violent event. I remember, you know, what you're looking at here are basically snapshots in time, because this is not a stat. This is not a static event where n nobody is moving. This is a dynamic event. All the parties here are moving. You know, if I'm attacking you, you're not just going to stand there and let me hit you in the head, right? Okay, you're going to move. You're going to defend yourself, right? And, but if I do hit you in the head and cause the bleeding, I may cause some dizziness or even knock you out, or I may cause you to start to fall. And then I hit you again and create more spatter. So uh, there's at least two or three, um, there's a, there, this possibly suggests at least two or three impacts. Okay. One to start the bleeding and then these two. Okay. Um, so we have now a position in three dimensions where that blood came from on the spatter for the ground. And then we have in two dimensions, the area of convergence for the spatter on the driver's side of the Land Rover. Yeah. Okay. So 
So a lot of people are confused and saying, well, why does this, what does this have to do with uh, Traconis, Michelle Traconis? She, she, she wasn't in that garage. Why are they doing this? And well, I, they have to prove that she's dead. Right. But I'm talking about Michelle Traconis, who's on trial. Right, she's on trial for conspiracy for homicide, right? For conspiracy to mur for murder. They're laying right? down the foundation that Jen that a murder did in fact occur here, and then and that, that it, w it was her boyfriend and her and the victim's ex husband. And when they discard all of the evidence throughout mm -hmm. the various videos that we have, all of us have seen Jennifer uh, Michelle Traconis inside um, Fotis Dulos pickup truck as he goes and deposited in 30 different locations, her uh, clothing, soaked in blood, her bra, her all the different various items from Jennifer. Uh, this is how a, 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 a prosecutor lays his foundation and his case down. So now, in order for, and, and that tells me a lot right there, that they removed her clothing, her blood-soaked clothing. You know, so they didn't, so to me, that tells me they didn't, Again, this may be a trigger alert for some people that uh, they didn't bury her body intact with her clothing, or they didn't deposit her in a um, in a cesspool, right. or or a um, what is it called? Uh, not a cesspool, but the other one, um, septic tank, septic. Um, with her clothing on. So I'm thinking they dismembered her. Yeah. Okay. Why yeah. else would you take the clothing off a dead victim? And then, and then go to garbage can to garbage cans all, all around um, Hartford, Connecticut. Right. It, it makes no sense. Okay. Yep. Um, Nerd, Eva asked, do you think this was blunt force or a knife? Um, that's but, why you have to examine the clothing. You have to look at the clothing to see if there's any defects that would say it's a knife or it's a gun. Uh, but this is this spatter pattern here it is not, um, it's not consistent with uh, ballistics. OK, uh, it's a little larger than you would normally see for ballistics. So it's more more indicative of blunt force trauma of, of blunt force trauma or a knife. Yeah. OK, now let's move on, Ron. OK, you want me to fast forward it to. The yeah, next? let's show that and show that one. So this is just another view, folks, so you can see oh, where wow. those lines are coming up from the floor, where on the other side, the um, the rain, uh, the suburban would have would have been. Yes. And then this is C, uh, marker C 42. Then I can't make out what the third one is, but there's these three markers and these markers are indicating. The well, C is a zone. C is a zone, but the tents are, are evidence markers. Yeah. So 42. And then the other one, I can't really make out the number. And then you have all your measurement markers uh, along here. So okay. go ahead, take it. So you see the tripod and then you see the white uh, scale going up it. OK, I have the exact same uh, setup and it's showing you where in three dimensions in space, that victim bled from that height. Where on the body? I, I, I can't tell you. OK. And then you, if you look to the left on the side of the Land Rover or the Range Rover, um, you see the two dimensional area of origin is just slightly below uh, there for a secondary spatter pattern. There are two different patterns here. Okay, so let's move on. Hold on a second, because they kind of zoom in a little bit here. I just wanted to, I didn't want to pass this up. People looking at this looks like a little red stain here. These are little stains. What are what are we looking at here where I'm going? Well, there's there's not many evidence markers there, so I don't I don't know exactly what it is or whether it was tested or collected. Okay. Do you want audio on this or no? Uh, no, so just keep going forward. Okay, go to that. Okay, folks. There's the infamous Chuck Taylor converse in blood. Okay. Again, and let's bring me up. You want, you want me to bring up what you have? Okay, so no, folks, this is just partial. I didn't hear anything in the testimony where they tried to enhance this with Luco Crystal Violet for the missing information for the shoe, okay? 
Um, so let, let's get uh, let's bring the camera up on me. And so, folks, here is uh, what I did today. Um, here is a uh, Chuck Taylor Converse uh, in blood on paper. Okay, and that's what it would look like uh, if someone had a bloody shoe bottom uh, and stepped on the paper like this. Um, so it's not always going to look like this. Depends on how much blood uh, is on the shoe. This but, is actually what Ed Wallace did today for a demonstration from this shoe right here, ladies and gentlemen. So he so if you had him yeah. blood and then put it on that piece of paper. Go ahead, Ed. So there's the shoe, and you can see the pattern. Now go back to the uh, to the floor of the garage there. All right? Can everybody make it out? If you can make out what Ed just saw, just let us know in the chat with a yes. Um, can you see the, the top of the Chuck Taylors? Let's look again at my shoe. Okay. Let me go full screen with you. So there's right. that shoe. Now, now look at the garage again. Can everybody see it? Okay. Now, unfortunately, he was asked the questions about this by the defense, not the prosecutor, which I found odd. And he didn't do anything with it. Um, so he didn't. He didn't. He says it's an it's a it's a transfer of a possible footwear, but he did he didn't um, say that it was a Chuck Taylor Converse. I guess he didn't have the training to do that. Or and I don't know if they got a shoe wear impression expert to to look at this because right. it could have been enhanced. Now, Ron, but, could you? I, I, I want to just say something because in the very first video, the only video that we did on this trial, and you could see it in the playlist. It's going to be linked down below in the description. But our very first video that we did after day one and two, Ed, you made me stop on those that sneaker. Mm -hmm. You made me stop on that sneaker because it was in the little shoe. Um, it was in the cubby, cubby hole in the mudroom. There was a Chuck Taylor high top in there. Now, I don't know who's it belonged to, but I would have definitely looked at it after seeing that pattern in the um, on the floor in the garage. Yeah. Now, Ron, if you could show them the patterns I made on my garage floor. All right. Just give me two seconds. You could just scan the chat real quick while I pull that up. Just go ahead, Ed. You got the show. Okay, folks. So earlier today, um, I, I put my son's Chuck Taylors on and I coated them with blood and I stepped on my concrete floor in my basement, my bare concrete floor to try to replicate what we were seeing in um, this uh, garage. And I did accomplish that. I took a couple photographs of it. So there is the, the Chuck Taylors. You see that it's like slightly coated with, with blood. And pay attention to the top because in, on that garage floor that we saw at the crime scene, this is what was prominent in the in the, at the, in the top of it. Correct, Ed? Mm -hmm. On that pattern. Uh, I'll go to the next. Okay, so there's there's one pattern that I left uh, in blood on my concrete floor in your garage. In my, in my garage. Okay, you can barely just make it out. But that can be enhanced with, like I said, the um, blood chemical leucocrystal violet. Let's see the next one, Ron. Was there any mention of leucocrystal violet used? No, not one in the testimony. Wow. Wouldn't be the first time, Dawn Marie, that I, I created a crime scene in my garage for a district attorney or so forth. I had them come over and I would do experiments there to show them. So I, right. you put this down on the paper again? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Now, the more and more you walk with bloody soles on your shoes, the the less and the less blood stays on the shoe. You, the more you deposit, and it becomes uh, more visible. Uh, so let's let's move on a little bit. Or, or if the perpetrator tried to dab it with a paper towel, or, or walk, dab, walk on a paper towel, or walk on a paper towel, or clean it off with a blanket, or any of the other numerous items that were recovered. Uh, from in those 30 different dump locations? My garage or my basement. That's right. I've used my basement too, my friends there. I wasn't born with with thorns, yes. So All right, let's look at this. Green is the top of the shoe, and in right. the bottom of this picture up at the top of your screen is the back part of the shoe. Now, see, folks, there again, that's more close to what was in their garage, Okay. And there is missing information there, but if you if you didn't use the leucocrystal violet, uh, you may never have visualized it or seen it. Um, 
Ron, do you have the uh, photographs from when I did the blood stain uh, forensic Friday? I I do, but I don't have them oh. set up. All right, let me get it. Let me get it, and I'll show them. Okay. All right. I want to show a couple of more of these pictures. Hold on a second. I just want to make sure I got them right. Because you did some stuff. Okay, we're going to get to this. This uh, your paper towel uh, also yeah. demonstration. Yeah, let me get to that in a minute when we get to the car. So let me uh, get some. Let me bring these photos up. So hashtag Ed, hashtag Duty Ron. While Ed searches for that, I want to just say this is again what we offer here is true crime from the investigator's perspective. Ed is a retired NYPD crime scene unit forensic expert. And as he searched for that, I'm just going to blow him up a little bit and toot his horn. He's investigated and processed over 2,500 crime scenes in his time. And he is testified in court of law as an expert witness many, many times. I'm not going to use numbers because Ed will correct me, but he has testified numerous times. And listen, any district attorney or any defense attorney, if they had Ed to testify, would just be such an, such an asset to um, the defense or a prosecution. And I, I really wish that um, that the, the prosecutor in this case would have reached out to him because he would have gladly come on. Um, so Ed's just search, searching for what he needs to get. If you're not yet subscribed, consider subscribing here on Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. If you can, hit the thumbs up, share this video, and we will get into more of the forensics. I love that you love learning with us, and I'm going to go to the Super Chats real quick. Jeff sends in a Super Chat and says, Ed, do you think dismemberment, that he dismembered her in the garage, we already covered that as a possibility, as a potential? Uh, I don't think so in the garage. I don't know uh, it in the garage, but there's a potential that she was dismembered, and it will be based on... Uh, the evidence when they review and look at the clothing and, and stuff that was um, discarded. Right. Not in this garage. There's just not enough blood there. And there's no way he would have been able to clean it up to that degree. Maybe in his other location uh, where, right. you know, he was. Okay. Let me. Um, Web Weaver, thank you for being a member for 12 months. Holy cow. It's been a year. Dr. Henry Lee is head of the crime lab in Connecticut. So no Beth, more. No, he's not. He's retired. Nobody from. Farmington goes into Hartford to dispose of garbage. Yeah, he's no longer. Um, you know this, Ed, because I know you're. Yes, I know Henry. He's retired. Sherry Davis, five dollars. How? Plus, please explain, Ed. How did all of this between eight a.m., eight ten a.m., and ten thirty, ten forty-five ish? I mean, that would you know again. That's that would... when she. That's when she was killed. That doesn't mean she. Uh, that's when she was killed in between this time and then tra possibly transferred in the suburban to the other location where she would then be transferred to another vehicle and gone someplace else, maybe for dismemberment. All right. You ready, Ed? Take over. Hold on. Hold on. Not yet. Let me, let me just uh, get uh, one more thing here. It's tough when you're working with one screen. Uh, yeah, I miss my dual screens. Yep, I'm going to look to the chat and say hello to Jennifer Nobles. Let us know where you're watching city and state. Uh, just so while we're waiting for Ed to get his next um, demonstration, um, city, state, let us know if you're new by putting a new in the chat. And we have a lot of new subscribers. So I want to say thank you and welcome to all the new. Welcome to the old and returning subscribers and friends of Crime Time with Duty Ron who watch us from the outside. We're always appreciative of all of you. Rhode Island, Pittsburgh, Middletown, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. South Africa, says Barbara. Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Maya, thank you for being here. Hello from Montana. Mobile, Alabama. Ontario, Canada, Boston. Hello, Mermaid. Uh, Jersey Devil, um, she's trying to throw us off by saying she's in Virginia. Um, okay, Little Rock, Todd, good to see you. Thank you. Hello. Am I projecting now? You are, Ed. We have you. I'm going to go full screen with it. What are we looking at here? We're looking oh, at a, this. A, par a parquet wood floor. And to your naked eye, you can't see any footwear impression on there. No, I right? can't see anything here. You can't see anything? It's not projecting? No. I mean, you, I can see what you're saying, but you can't see any footwear impression. Right. You can't see any footwear impressions. All right. So now. Crime scene, Ed? What's that? Is this an actual crime scene? Yes. All right. So now I'm going to show you what hitting that same parquet floor with the Luco Crystal Violet does. The, the suspense is killing me, Ed.
Can yeah. you all see that? Oh, you could see it clear as day. Two two imprints. Yeah, it's like a Timberland style footwear impression from a boot. Okay. <clears throat> so it went wow. from nothing to that, just hitting it with the Luco Crystal Violet. Yeah, so it's adhering um, to the hemoglobin in the blood here and creating this uh, visibility of the, of the blood footwear impression, and it's fixing it. It's actually, think of it as uh, super gluing it to the floor now. It's fixed. Can't be, I, I, I can wash it away, but it would take a lot of effort. What now? Okay. Well, let me ask you, Ed. Let me play um, one of our chat, one of our folks from the chat. Let me just be a, a, a watcher and ask you a question. Why, in God's name, would the crime scene unit investigators not Luco Crystal Violet that entire area in the garage and the steps leading into the house and the kitchen or whatever is inside those steps? Because maybe there was people going in and out, in and out, in and they out. They could have used this or amino black, another chemical. Um, but I preferred this. But I really don't have any idea why they didn't. I, I haven't heard thus far yeah. anybody testify to or talk about enhancing these contact transfer stains. Maybe then, we'll hear about it. But if we were to hear about it, we, now would be the time. Anybody you think it would have been done at yeah. the time right. of the, the bloodstain pattern testimony or Detective Riley's testimony? Right. Right. And because he performed, yeah. he performed the um, presumptive blood test in the field. How many people in the chat uh, were, were dying to ask that question? We're dying to ask Ed that question. I, I almost felt it inside of me like to, that you guys were wanting me to ask him that question because when he just showed this example, the first thing that came to my mind is, wait a minute, I would be Luco Crystal violating the shit out of that garage. Yeah. Uh, or they could have, you know, blacked it, or they could have used a, a Blue Star or Luminal. Um, but anyhow, yeah. uh, so, I mean... Maybe there, maybe there's something going to surprise me this week in the testimony. Maybe they did do it, and we just don't know about it. If they didn't do it, um, shame on them. I don't know why they wouldn't have. When it's clearly a footwear impression, it's clearly this, yeah. okay? And even though that uh, lieutenant colonel didn't want to uh, state that it was a Chuck Taylor Converse, I, I can understand that if he does not expertise in that. Right. But then you get a footwear examiner to come and look at it and enhance it and and say, okay, so at least you, what you get from this is class characteristic evidence initially, but if there's finer details, you may get individualistic evidence. Then you get a warrant and you search for um, Photos' shoes and looking for a Chuck Taylor Converse, right? Or you find out through investigation <laughs> if if the victim had Chuck Taylor Converse's or whatever the case may be, may seem. Yeah, um, yeah so... Um, yeah. But, you know, anyhow, yeah. Let, let's move on to the contact transfer on the um, car. Okay. So I'm going to take off um, what you sent me today. Uh, hashtag Ed Wallace, hashtag Duty Ron in the chat. Ed, you got it just for a minute. So we okay. want contact transfer. And it's, that's the same piece from the Lieutenant Colonel in the afternoon? Yeah, but the, the video um, of the front of the car. Let me make sure I got it. Ed, scan the chat if you can. This is, uh, let's see, I see something. Are they effective uh, on heavily bleached blood? Ed? Now, if, if blood is bleached, um, if bleach is a strong oxidizer, it's going to destroy uh, any ability to get genetic markers and any ability to um, for these um, uh, chemicals to get um, a definitive pattern. Uh, bleach can inhibit many of these chemicals from establishing patterns. Right. You'll get a re you get a reaction with many of these chemicals with bleach. <clears throat> I'm going to the morning to look to see what we have here. No, it was in the afternoon. Why did I not see it there? Afternoon, day six. Or maybe it was in the morning. I know when you showed the contact transfer on the Land Rover, you showed me the photos earlier. Yeah, it was it was the morning. Let me just get it. A lot of questions coming in for Ed in the, the, chat. the photos. The photos were on you on your WhatsApp, Ron. They're still there if you can I pull them up. I'd rather show the video. Golly, the, the, it's called local crystal violet. It's a liquid. It's not actual crystals. Okay, um, it's a it's a liquid chemical. 
You sure that wasn't Detective Riley when we showed the? No, no, it was it was definitely um, the Lieutenant Colonel. Hmm. Yeah, keep going. When he gets to the Range Rover. Hold on, folks. Bear with me here. We're looking. I don't, I don't see it. Damn it. Can you bring up your WhatsApp photos? The ones you sent me today? Yeah, no, they're all gone. No, I still have them on my phone. You you got rid of them? I got rid of them, yeah, because I didn't want to show that. I didn't I wanted to show what I saved. Hold on a second. D6. Ron, it's this one. All right, you want to just talk about what you wanted to talk about with the car? No, I, I really want to show the pattern. All right, so um, why don't you put up the, um, the photographs I sent you of um, the car while you search in the background um, for those others uh, with the... Land Rover. So there was a contact transfer right by the logo on the front grill on the chrome section. Okay. And he testifies to it. The Lieutenant Colonel te testifies to it being um, a contact transfer. So, okay. So what you're looking at here is um, a chrome grill from a different car, but I used blood on a soaked paper towel and transferred the pattern of the towel in blood onto the chrome. Can everybody see this? I could see it top here. Right. And then right here. So that's the paper towel pattern uh, onto the car in blood. Okay. So uh, let's go to the next one. So here is a kitchen glove pattern in blood on the chrome. Okay. It's right here where my mouse is circling. There's actually three stains on here, right? Right, but two that have detail and one that doesn't. Okay. Right. All right. Right there, can you zoom in on that? And then don't move. Okay, so can everybody see those patterns? This is this is not luminal. No, this has nothing to do with luminal. That's actual blood on chrome, okay? And that's the way it appeared there uh, from a glove transfer. A glove had blood on it, and then I, we did contact transfer, passive contact transfer to the surface of the chrome. Okay, let's go to the next one. Keep going. That's just the same one. Okay, let's... Go to the next one. Okay. So this is a paper towel transfer. Uh, go down. Right. Can you zoom in anymore? That's it. Well, that's a blood transfer from paper towel to the back of a paper plate, uh, just to give you some context. Okay. There's one, two, three, four. It looks like one, two, three, four, five. Now, if I were to hit that, go up, go up to the top. If I would have hit that one right now where your cursor is with Luco Crystal Violet, you would see the, the towel diamond pattern pop up. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next one. Okay. So here's the glove transfer to the plate. Now you can see um, how that looks. Okay. Now, if we can find that image from the trial. Yeah, I'm going to do my best, but I, I can only do one thing at a time. So, <laughs> okay, so let's let's shut this down and then let's try to find that from the trial. 
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna search it. Um again, hashtag ed, hashtag duty ron with your questions. Um as I search glove, paper towel, paper so towel. When um yeah, you can bring up the paper towels from the crime scene, then you know, we could show that. So there were, you know, there were several there was a roll of paper towel that was collected. There was a, a roll of paper towels in a um pantry, uh, I don't believe was collected, but uh, if they suspected that these patterns could have been produced by a paper towel, then, as I said, they should have conducted some controlled experiments with the paper towels that they found at the crime scene and blood on the very surfaces of the garbage can or the um, the grill of the um, vehicle uh, to see if they can match that. So there is the roll of paper towel. Now, originally, that paper towel roll was on that paper towel roll holder. Somebody took it off, but Detective Riley has no idea, Sergeant Riley has no idea who did it. Because in the original walkthrough video, that paper towel uh, roll was on that holder. And that paper towel contained uh, blood on the top of the roll and inside of the cardboard. There it is, okay? Um, and and uh, this was also tested in presumptively, and it's right by the, um, kitchen sink where uh, Fotos's DNA was found. Mm. Okay, so let's move on. Here's a question from Muddy Pause Super Chat. Uh, does luminol or Blue Star wash off? Well, it Blue Star is different than Leucal Crystal Violet or Minio Black. Blue Star and luminol are a chemical luminescence. And so what happens is when you spray it on suspected latent blood, that means a surface that you can't see blood with your naked eye, it adheres to the iron in the hemoglobin, okay, and then causes a chemical luminescence that only lasts as long as the chemical is in contact with that surface. Once you stop spraying the liquid chemical, the uh, luminescence goes away. So it's not as if it can wash, but it, you know, if you spray too much of it, you can dilute whatever um, sample you're looking to uh, retrieve. It also it also reacts with um, uh, other chemicals such as uh, bleach and copper and certain other items, but okay, there's that purple glove, just like uh, just like this one, right here. All right, okay, and again, um, there was indication that 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 was possibly a bloody glove that transferred to the uh, surfaces in the garage. So if we can ever find it. Look at this. Uh, Siki is saying, Ron, when can we watch the training video you and Ed have created last week? It was just a couple of days ago. We're working on uploading it and um, editing it. So when we have it ready, we will definitely, Siggy Thurston, we will definitely show it. Uh, just please be patient. Uh, we, we got a little bit of work to do. Um, this is this is uh, Jennifer's uh, toothbrush that they did the... Uh, they got her DNA from to use uh, as to eliminate uh, this, her from the other sources or to identify her with the sources of the blood that were recovered in in the crime scene in the garage. Yeah. And again, we're talking about uh, Michelle uh, Traconis's trial that is ongoing right now. And we are talking about the evidence with our crime scene evidence expert, Ed Wallace. Um, where else? No, it, won't, it won't be with him. It won't be with Riley. It has to be with the blood spatter guy, the lieutenant colonel. Right. So it's day six video. Yep. All right. Let me get this off. I searched both days. I both. I searched the morning and the afternoon. It's the, the, it's the afternoon. Okay. Let me get it up again. And. Oh, okay. Hold on a second. I think it was in the early part of the afternoon. Yeah, Lynn, I see what you're saying about the nanny said the kids came through the garage, but it's um, the, the footwear impression seems to be a, a kind of larger than a child's shoe. All right, we didn't want to see this. Just keep going, just keep going through. We'll see if we can find it when he gets to the car. Obviously, the car is gone there. So, um, Keep going. Let's see if we see pictures with the car back there. Okay, now the car is back there. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. 
Okay, right. there, there's the uh, radial impact spatter on the side of the Land Rover. Keep going. He did the two-dimensional origin. There's the on the on the carriage uh, there. That's the suburban. Keep going, keep going. Okay, I think we're getting close now. Keep going, keep going. That's the two-dimensional area. There we go. All right, right on that Land uh, Range Rover logo on the grill is a contact transfer in the chrome on top of it. So let's see if we can keep going. There you go. Stop. Let's see if we can zoom in on that. Uh, I think they actually do. Yeah. Oh, that's as close as we can get. I can't zoom in on it, Ed. Let's see if you go a little further in the in the video. If it goes, uh, gets any. Nope. Go back. Yeah. Okay. All right, folks. Now, from uh, from this appearance here, that could be either a paper towel or a glove. Okay. Once they sampled this from this area of the vehicle and swabbed it and got rid of it and cleaned it off, they should have gotten a warrant and got permission to uh, take the uh, grill out glove to take the glove and you know you don't have to take the grill out, but to take the glove and to take paper towels that were found in there that they collected for evidence and done a series of controlled. Uh, experiments by placing blood on the towel, placing blood on the glove, and then doing some contact transfers here to see if they can uh, duplicate what we're seeing here. Can everybody see the pattern in there? The folks can zoom on their phone, Ed, so they can zoom or on their video, and they can. Uh, I, I can I can zoom on mine too, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm looking at it now. So again, it depends on what type of paper towels it is. Okay. Yeah. So folks, you can zoom in on your own screen, and you can get a look at it to see if it's a paper towel or a glove. Yeah. Ron, you just you just did that? You went full screen? Huh? You went full screen? It is full screen right now. No, I said you did it. You went full screen. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. So Does everybody see that? Because it could be a glove, but I, again, I don't have enough detail here to, to say, uh, to differentiate between a glove or a paper towel. So, and I think that they would know. And we, my question to you, Ed, is, is why why didn't they process this evidence at the lab? Why did they just do presumptive on this? In, I don't know. I mean, they could have done leucocrystal crystal violet on this as well and then seen if there's any more missing uh, portions of this pattern in blood that is there, but they just couldn't see it with their naked eye. What would be the reason why they wouldn't do that? Maybe they didn't have the chemical. Maybe they didn't have the training on the use of the chemical. I find that highly unlikely, given it's the state police and they had all these other chemicals present. So, so I, I don't, I don't know why. So this could be someone who was wearing a glove and leaned up against the car, maybe slip, well, and then maybe using paper towels to wipe down blood off the side of the car, because right. there were several um, blood stains that were called altered blood stains. They were deposited onto the side of the vehicle, and. Um, the way a blood stain uh, dries, it dries from the least amount of blood to the most amount of blood. Okay, so typically that's the outer perimeter dries first and it dries inward towards the center. Yeah. So if the blood started to dry and then somebody uh, around the perimeter and then somebody wiped through it or, um, with a towel, they could have obliterated the center portions of the blood and just left the outline of the blood, which is what's done, what you're seeing right there. Go back to that. Right there. You see those circles? That's dried blood on the perimeter. The, the blood is missing from the interior portions of the stain. So somebody could have wiped that as it was drying and only the dry blood stayed behind and the wet blood went on the towel. Right. Okay. And then you see down here below is what we call, uh, that's a rivulet of blood that is uh, blood flowing downward by gravity. Right, right here, right below the sign, uh, right below this white evidence is, marker. Somebody can't hear me, Fuzzy Doxy, you can't hear me? You're fine, Ed, don't worry about it. People oh, have okay. problems on their end, we're good, we're okay. good. Um, 
All right. And then if you look at the side of the car door, let's get to that door right there. Okay. You see all of this? Well, that could be one of two things. That could be an attempt to clean up, or this could be the area where the struggle initially occurred between our victim and, and her killer right here. And they're rubbing up against the door, uh, fighting, uh, she fighting for her life. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. There's information here that could have been gleaned that there should have been a little more, um, uh, search if they find the clothing, if they have the clothing, they say from the, um, from the, um, garbage cans that he photos dumped the clothing, then they sh should have been tested and samples of whatever that dust is should have been collected. Yeah. And then they see if we can find that dust on, or that could be road salt or snow salt or anything like that, but see if they could find that whatever that material is after it's analyzed in the lab on the victim's clothing that was recovered from the garbage cans. And you know, the two officers who responded, uh, remember they were talking about a deer strike they're looking at the front of that vehicle. I mean, you hit a deer, a deer strike, you're going to have damage. Um, so I, th I found it odd that they were even talking about deer strikes, but that was just the responding officers that were doing the welfare check. But what are we looking at here, Ed? This is the bottom part where you would see like a mud flap for a vehicle. This just doesn't have them, but this is the front of the wheel well, I believe, or maybe it could be the rear. No, it's the front. It's got to be the front because there's the door. Uh, the crease here for the door. So this is the driver side front right uh, front left driver side wheel well. Can, uh, can continue going forward or go back a little bit. Let me see. I got to get some reference. Okay, that's the front. That's the the that's the front uh, skirt on the um, bumper. Go wrap around. That's the back. Okay, of that wheel well. That's the driver's. Uh, tire wheel well right there the rear and what is he pointing to there he's, tr he's pointing to a uh, transfer contact transfer stain okay so everything happened here on this driver's side of that range rover right keep going what do we got next i thought i saw yeah and so there's a lot of wipes and swipes in here his testimony talks about that now uh, everybody knows the difference between a wipe and a swipe, right? A wipe is going through something that's already there, okay? Whereas a swipe is bringing something to a different location that wasn't there and moving through it, right? Okay, so like a bloody hand swiping onto a concrete surface that didn't have blood or a wipe where the concrete surface had blood on it and then you wipe through it, right? Okay. And, you know, if you don't know the difference, like, you know, when you go to the bathroom and you do number two, you're not swiping anything. You're wiping. Oh, my head. Unless you have a bidet and then all bets are off. Thanks for the visual. I appreciate <laughs> that. I, um, it, it looks like this is where it ends here because then they take a break. And then um, they come back with uh, testimony from uh, from the nanny. She does quite a bit of testi testimony, testifying. You swipe your credit card. Yeah. And then, okay. Uh, what do we got here, Ed? Okay. So a lot of this is all those little brown stuff. Okay. Oh, perfect. Uh, you you can see a pattern in here, and it looks like there are three digits, like three fingers, and it looks like a glove pattern. So it looks like three separate fingers. Okay. Um, from a glove in blood on, on the concrete floor. Now, all that brown material is um, uh, seeds and plant material um, that's found all over the floor of a garage, okay? And that's part of that uh, those um, that material that got on top of uh, some of the, look, like that one right there, the evidence scale there uh, to the right has one of the, uh, that substance on top of it. No, on top, yeah, right there. Okay, so if you look at my hand, if you bring my hand back up, okay, so it looks like three fingers, right, three fingers, and you can see the palm go back to the floor, and let's see if we can zoom in there. Folks, you can zoom in yourself and get better detail here. So it looked like he may have, the person may have, Bent down, 
Let's see. Yep, I could get it. I did it. Yep, there it is. May have bent down. Can everybody see it? If you zoom in on it, you could see it. May have bent down, put his bloody hand with the, that was in a glove at the base of uh, at the top of the palm where it meets the fingers, and then the three fingers start to come out. Yeah. You definitely see it, and everybody is zooming in and looking, and there's a lot of yeses in the chat. A lot of people are. Again, oh. if they would have hit this with Luco Crystal Violet, maybe more of this pattern would have come up. I'm just so surprised that the Connecticut State Police didn't use that Luco Cr Crystal Violet uh, or something similar, um, because this is a huge case, and um, unbeknownst to them. They were never gonna. They were never gonna find her remains. Uh, they didn't know at that time whether they were gonna find her remains or not. Jennifer Dulos, mother of five, murdered inside her home May twenty fourth of twenty nineteen. Yeah, there should have been some type of pattern expert that got involved in this case, and then um, once they were told about potential patterns, come in here and enhance these stains with the local crystal violet and then conduct those controlled experiments with the paper towel or the gloves. Yeah. Or, you know, and, and the gloves rather, as opposed to, or. Right. Well, we're going to continue to follow this. The trial is going to resume tomorrow and um, we're going to continue to follow it. And um, Ed and I will be listening. Ed, I, are you traveling this week or are you uh, still home? Are you, are you out? No, of I'm home. I'm home. Okay, so Ed's home. I know he'll be looking at this trial and we'll be looking to cover other cases. But um, you guys have been great in the chat. Um, I mean, this trial is just beginning. It's in its infancy stages. We're going to hear from 245 more witnesses. Um, so they said 300 total. So we're going to you know, hear from quite a bit more uh, witnesses, quite a few more uh, people and experts come on and you know this this is this, this is a long haul stay in it um, pay attention and now you guys have a little bit more of an education when it comes to um, the forensics part of this Ed, do you think we'll be hearing from more do you think they'll bring in a footwear impression expert the defense maybe no no i don't think the defense will do it but uh because the defense tried to ask the bloodstain pattern anal analyst if he uh if he uh, knows what type of shoe it is and so forth, then he he wouldn't bite on that. Yeah, Nerdy and his girl Eva are. I like that they have their own their own little um, YouTube. Nerdy and Eva says thanks for covering this. Yeah, he, um, he he did some unbelievable um, coverage with drone footage, and he does it on all the cases that he's on: Summer Wells, uh, Harmony Montgomery. So everybody knows Nerdy uh, and the Nerdy Bird Mafia. So thank you, Nerdy, for being here and, and Eva and everybody else. Uh, I want to thank our replay viewers and the folks who sent Super Chat during the course of this live stream uh, and all the new members and all of the Duty Ron family who come in and join us and respectfully ask those questions. And listen, this is this is a, a tough case, and we're going to follow it. Mother of five uh, never found her remains. God only knows what uh, Fotis Dulos did with her remains and how she was killed. We we don't know. It's all speculation at this time. Uh, Jennifer Nobles, good to see you. Thank you for being here. And if you like what you saw, please watch our first video. I'll link it in the description. I'll put it in one of the cards up here. You guys can see it. Ed, are you still searching for stuff? Uh, no, no. Okay. I thought maybe you were looking for more forensics before. Well, I, I, was, I was looking at the photos you sent me, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, look, those photos, I was just sending you off of the videos that we have here. Yeah, so. no, we got it, though. We got it all. Yeah. It was a little tough. I'll go back and edit the parts where we're sitting and waiting to try to find it. No, uh, no, don't do that. Don't do yeah, that. That's not salty, so sad. Salty C is a member for 26 freaking months. Hey, Ed, do yes. wrong. Thanks for all you do, says Salty C. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Salty C. Thank you. We appreciate you. And it looks like you're a nurse. So thank you for what you do. Yes. Yes. God bless. Uh, I'm just looking to see if there's any questions in the chat because I love to interact with the live audience. Darlene Wolf says, I feel bad for the kids. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, you know, DJT says, my stomach dropped. Yeah. Great information as always, says Karen Solek. Thank you. Um, looking forward to seeing the part that I missed, says Marzi. One, thank you. 
Thank you. Hey, we love the replay viewers, don't we, Ed? Um, the replay viewers are uh, part of this community and they're a heartbeat of this Crime Time with Duty Ron movement. So kudos to the replay viewers, the super chatters, the folks who send us cups of coffee that become Patreon, that go that extra step. I know that everybody can't do it, but we are so appreciative of everything. And, and just subscribing, it's free. And hitting the thumbs up, uh, it doesn't cost you anything. And I thank you for doing that. Ed, do you have anything else, final thoughts on the forensics? Do, are we going to be seeing anything else here, Ed? Is there any wow moments forensically, or have they have they got it all out? Well, I haven't heard any. Um, I mean, it seems like every, every time the, the, the prosecution is about to put on a forensic expert in some um, discipline, there's all these objections that he brings up. But I haven't heard anything about, you know, uh, pattern analysis of the um, – of those uh, contact transfers. I haven't heard anything about Luco crystal violet uh, or enhancements or anything like that. Um, so uh, I don't know. I don't know. So we'll have to check uh, the trial starting Monday to see if where this is going. Yep. Um, I know there were up to um, the getting the videos and trying to put the videos. Uh... I don't know what happened to Ed, but it sounds like he froze up. So let me just, let me remove him and then add him back. Okay, he's back. Mm -hmm. um, something happened. You just froze up. So we didn't, we didn't oh, okay. get the end of what you said. So what, what I said is I'll have to watch Monday because, you know, every time um, the prosecutor is going to bring in a different forensic discipline, uh, there's always objections by the defense attorney before that individual comes to testify. Right. And I haven't heard anything about anybody um coming to testify about enhancing these patent stains and doing patent stain analysis uh, to try to say, okay, this stain came from a glove, this stain came from a paper towel or, or anything like that. So the last that uh, I saw is they were trying to get the videos in from Hartford showing uh, photos and his girlfriend traveling from garbage can to garbage can depositing these garbage bags. Sickening. So sickening. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, you know, Michelle Traconis, as we saw on the Hartford um, traffic cams and, and, you know, just that one one video of her reaching out from the passenger side of the pickup truck as he was going into the back and taking numerous bags out. That was enough for me. Once I saw that, I was like, Shh. she has full knowledge of what took place and what went on. And, you know, that was his living girlfriend. And that's what broke up the marriage. Um, so Jennifer Doulos knew that she was cheating as we heard from the nanny and she was in fear for her life and got armed security. Uh, I just, I wish that she had armed security or some type of security that day or some kind of video footage inside that rented home where she was living. I, I, I wish because if she had it, um, it would be probably a game changer, you know, and, and it may or may not have, you know, broke this case, but you know, we, we don't have it. So listen, um, the 29th, which is just, uh, less than nine days away. Um, Shonda Vander Ark and her son, Paul Ferguson is going to be sentenced. That's January 29th. That's not this Monday, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. So, um, I'm going to cover that live. The, the sentence, uh, of Shonda Vander Ark and her son. Let us know in the comments down below what your thoughts on that case is. Many of you feel that the son should just, you know, get a light sentence and get some intensive therapy. Um, we'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that because we all have different thoughts and opinions. But yeah, we did a video last night. Go and check that out. I'll link it in some cards up here and on the replay. You guys can see that. Um, we'll be on it. Ed's going to be traveling during that time. So I think I'll just cover it um, live as they sentence it gets imposed. And we know that Shonda should burn in her little small cage. In, she's going to burn in hell. We know that. But she should have a miserable time as far as I'm concerned. I hope she doesn't have one good day for the rest of her life. And she's now in her small little room serving out her sentence, life sentence as it will be, I believe. Ed, you always have something to say at the end. We're going to wrap it up. All right, folks. Thanks for being here. Spread the word about us. Uh, thanks for your subscriptions. 
And stay safe, stay prepared, and always wash your six. Amen to that, brother. And again, I'm going to send strength, prayers, and positive vibes to the folks in Connecticut and the prosecutor and the families of um, of the victims, Jennifer Dulos and her mom, who is now uh, watching the kids, Jennifer's mom, 88 years old, watching those five kids who are now growing up without their mom. So we send them strength, prayers, and positive vibes. And thank you. Thank you to everybody for being here. We love and appreciate you all. Good night from New York. We'll talk to you soon. Peace from Crime Time with Duty, Ron and Ed.